paper, I'm going to present the uh, results, some results of a recent Historic England survey of the Upper Plym Valley Guardianship Site. It's a bit of a mouthful. The Upper Plym Valley Guardianship Site on Dartmoor in Devon in the UK. The project was commissioned by the English Heritage Trust. The Trust is a public charity uh, which is responsible for just over 400 nationally important sites and monuments. The estate, the whole estate, includes four guardianship sites on Dartmoor, and these are being negatively affected by erosion, stimulated by visitor pressure and by the impacts of climate change. So at one of these guardianship sites, our aerial survey work has fed directly into a peatland restoration scheme. So I'm going to describe the Upper Pin Valley Guardianship site, the work completed by the Historic England team, and how the survey has influenced the peatland restoration program. So of course, any project success is dependent on an extended family. We acknowledge our, our permissions from our, our landowners, from our guardians, our site managers, um, from the National Park Authority. New imagery captured by Damien, which I'll, I'll talk about, and you'll hopefully remember back to some of the things he was telling you about how we were doing this work, processing by uh, my colleague Dave, field visits by, by other people in the team, data sets, national and local data sets from different archives, including the Historic England Archive and, and the local suppliers as well, Environment Agency LIDAR, um, other photography from other sources, um, and the data is all available, as is the site report. You can go and look at those online if you, if you want. <clears throat> so in this slide, I'm showing you a map of uh, the location of the Upper Pin Valley Guardianship site um, on Dartmoor in the southwest of England. So uh, the site, let's see if I can do it with this. No, I can't. Oh, there we go. Here we go. So this is the Upper Pin Valley Guardianship site. So here we are in the southwest of England in Devon, the brown splodge is Dartmoor, the pale green shape is, is Dartmoor. Here's the, here's the site. Dartmoor itself is a large upland area in the southwest of England. It's one of the UK's 15 national parks. And in this slide, I'm showing you a ground photograph of Hound Tor on Dartmoor. So Dartmoor is renowned for its expanses of wild windswept moorland, its biodiverse valleys, its enclosed farmland and its varied geology. Traditional farming practices are sustained through the moorland commons. And Dartmoor's myths and legends inspire art and literature and it's a popular tourist destination for the pursuit of outward, down, uh, outward bound pursuits, outward, out, outward bound activities. But maybe you all know it best for Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes classic The Hound of the Baskervilles. And in this slide, I'm outlining that guardianship site. So what you, the little polygon you saw, in, you saw in a black line before is now this white dotted, white dashed line uh, on the map with its scheduled ancient monuments. The Upper Bin Valley is the largest guardianship site in the whole of England. It comprises nearly 14 square kilometers on the southeast side of the River Plym. The underlying granite bedrock is mantled by blanket bog, by peat, and peaty, acidic, slowly permeable soils. The site is designated by the UK government for its nationally important archaeology, which includes 108 individually scheduled areas and a great number of, of non-designated, non-scheduled archaeological sites, which nonetheless, of course, form a significant part of the whole guardianship site. A series of research projects that were carried out between the 1970s and the 1990s underpin today's understanding of the archaeology and the guardianship site as a whole. And they include uh, an English Royal Commission aerial photographic survey of Dartmoor, which resulted in hand-drawn mapping at a scale of 1 to 10,560. The Upper Plym Valley's rich archaeological record includes ceremonial and funerary monuments of presumed Neolithic and early Bronze Age date, reeves, which are great long land boundaries, hut circles and enclosures of presumed mid to late Bronze Age date, evidence for medieval and post-medieval tin and peat extraction and processing, arable and pastoral agriculture of medieval and post-medieval date, post-medieval rabbit farming, 19th century granite quarrying, 19th and 20th century leets, which are water channels, 
for domestic and industrial water supply, Second World War training areas, and pits and infrastructure of China clay extraction. So in this slide, I'm showing you uh, a simple model of the Upper Pin Valley. It's made with a one meter LIDAR digital surface model just to try and give you an idea of the lie of the land. So given this complexity, the sheer size of the guardianship site and the difficulty of working on the ground in this upland terrain, aerial survey techniques provide an economical and efficient methodology to provide a current statement of the archaeological record. And to support their ongoing management, the English Heritage Trust require methods, of, um, methods and data to establish an assessment of change over time here in the site. So the work provided by Historic England includes work that Damien's already described, aerial photographs taken from a light aircraft to record sites in larger areas, which is part of our regular aerial monitoring of scheduled sites. Creation of also photography of the whole area to provide a point in time visual record of erosion and vegetation, repeatable or fixed interval, and in different growing seasons for future monitoring purposes and a baseline assessment of the archaeological features that are visible in all aerial sources, so including archived aerial photographs, LIDAR data sets, the newly captured imagery, and all of that mapped to the GIS. Now in this slide, I've got a little extract. It shows um, a part of Trollsworthy Rabbit Warren. It's an extract from the new ortho photography that we've taken. So let's talk about that survey. The flying altitude for the vertical aerial survey was 3,000 feet, which is roughly 1,500 feet above ground level. Hopefully you'll remember that photo of the camera pods on the strut of the Cessna aircraft that Damien showed you. That's the setup that we used um, to take this, this survey. The aim is to capture vertical photographs that overlap image to image 70% and side to side 40%. The survey was completed between about noon and 1.30 in the afternoon on the 30th of March, 2021. So that takes advantage of limited vegetation cover and flat light. That's going to support creating the ortho photography using structure formation. And it used 1,982 photographs. Their ground sampling distance ranges from about five to nine centimeters. Ground control had previously been established by the landscape survey team, such that the point cloud then created by structure from motion had a true ground positional accuracy of one to two centimeters. And the ground sampling distance of the process also photo, of which this is a part, is about eight centimeters. Okay, let's talk about the archaeology, which I think is more interesting than that other stuff. Different, you know, different things to look at people. So, in this extract, I hope it's going to give you a good sense of this ortho photography and how it indicates vegetation cover at the time of the survey. This is one of the things the English Heritage Trust is particularly concerned with here. We have three post-medieval pillow mounds. So these are part of the huge rabbit warrens that, that, cover, this, that cover this area. <clears throat> They've got differential plant growth on the mounds and then in the drainage ditches that surround them to help keep them dry. The pillow mounds themselves stand alongside bare, rocky piles that are part of the older tin screen works beside the river plain. And that dark strip at the very top of the image is a little bit of the water in the river. So you can imagine how photography captured in the same way at different times of the year and in, say, five-year intervals can help the trust to evaluate how this kind of vegetation is changing and what is happening to the archaeological features on the ground. So in this slide, I'm showing you a picture of exactly the same area, but this is from the digital surface model derived from the orthophotography. We're creating orthophotography using structure from motion, of course, means that also we can derive a digital surface model and visualize that in different ways using, in this instance, the relief visualization toolbox and here we're looking at the multi-lit hillshade. And I think this gives a slightly better idea of the, the relative forms and survival of those three pillow mounds. The two on the left actually are a bit less pronounced than the third one here on the right. I think it also helps to make a bit better sense of the shape of those bare rock piles from the, the tin streaming waste. And also the way that drainage ditches from the post-medieval Warren feeding into and are using the earlier, probably medieval, uh, waste as well. So this is improving our interpretation of relationships 
between a complex archaeological feature in this area. So in this slide, I'm showing you the extent of the guardianship site's newly mapped features. It's a baseline archaeological record for the 14 square kilometre area, and this is the first record of the archaeological site's form and extent that benefits from the spatial accuracy afforded by precisely geolocated aerial sources. But the guardianship site is so large that um, you know, it's difficult to get the range and extent of the archaeology across, and a map of the whole area like this on a single slide is a bit meaningless, really, isn't it? I mean, you know, what are, you, what are we even looking at here? So we'll focus on a few points of interest. So in this slide, I've included another extract from the Orso Mosaic, and it shows the long, trollsworthy double stone row and post-medieval meet these watercourses in this extract. So we've got a stone circle at the top of the double stone row coming down the middle of the image. One leet, the Lee Moor China clay leet, still deep and running with water. And then you can just about pick up some of the earthwork of a, a slightly earlier, shallower dry leet. The other thing I'd like you to notice here is all this water runoff. So from high ground in the top right hand corner, running down the slope into the leet, but in some instances breaking through and running out of the leet and carrying on down the moor and away down the contour. The high resolution also photo makes it really easy to pick out upstanding archaeological features, even ones as small as the individual standing stones of the double stone row and the stone circle. The image, of course, is georeferenced, so that mapping this in GIS is much easier than having to rectify individual aerial images in this almost control-free environment. Um, and, and yeah, we, we, because we've, we've taken this, this is, this is March, late March, and so we're getting these other information about what's going on on the land surface, as well as uh, the, these archaeological features that we're looking at here. So in this slide, I've shown you another extract from the ortho photography. It shows a large cairn, the, the rocky splodge in the middle of the image. It's a large Bronze Age cairn, and it stands in the southern part of the guardianship site. It's been dug into. Openings in the Rocky Mound are visible in the ortho photograph and, of course, in its digital surface model. So we're looking at the big hole up here in the top of it. There's another hole in the side here. And it's all a bit jaggedy and uneven around the, the, the bottom of it there. Um, <clears throat> these had previously been interpreted as internal chambers in this Bronze Age cairn. But actually, the hollows are more likely to be a combination of antiquarian excavation and, more recently, modern creation of shelters. If you're caught out here in the wind and the weather, there is no shelter, there is nowhere to go. It's quite understandable that people have shifted the rocks around and made themselves little shelters to get into. So on the basis of this imagery, English Heritage Trust could, if they wanted, choose to monitor the scheduled monument more closely for change caused by the visitors. They could target it for mitigation, perhaps. We'll move away from the also photo. In this slide, I'm showing you part of medieval and post-medieval heat processing and tin streaming landscape. And this is in a visualization, just an ordinary hill shade, of uh, one meter um, environment agency LIDAR data. So the guardianship site's highest ground is on its eastern and southeastern borders. It's characterized by these gently rounded hills of blanket bog, which I, I hope you just get that sense of. It's just a sort of slightly rolling, but it's the highest ground. It's nearly 500 meters above sea level. This is the watershed between the rivers Plym, Erm, and Yelm and their tributaries. And they're covered by large geometrically shaped peak cuttings, which are called ties. So we've got these, these divots in the, in the ground here. These holes are these really long ties. They can be more than 300 meters long. There are more down here in the bottom left. All of these scrapes and scars, these, these really big peak cutting areas. More up at the top right as well. <clears throat> 360 hectares of ties were mapped overall in um, uh, in this project. They're likely to represent peat extraction from medieval or even earlier domestic to post-medieval commercial peat cutting. And amongst the ties, assembled on the very highest ground, which we've got here, the guardianship boundary comes across, cuts right through it, but on the very highest ground in the middle here, 
um, we've got concentrations of subcircular or penambular mounds. So what looks like spots or acne, all the little blobs, these are these mounds that I'm talking about, either side of the boundary there. Initially inter interpreted as prehistoric burial mounds, research by Diana Walner and Laughing Phil Newman suggests that they're actually a form of charcoal burning platform known as a mela, and more than 100 of these were mapped during this project. When we're looking at a large area of the moorland in this hillshade of Environment Agency LIDAR data, it, it hints at the dispersed and, in fact, huge scale of this industrial landscape. Much of the tin streaming along the watercourses is likely to be medieval in date, extracting the tin. Now, peat charcoal was produced in these mealers, these platforms, into the 19th century, but it has its origins with the medieval carbonarii. These are specialists making fuel for tin smelting. And up to 100 of these men are documented working on Dartmoor by 1400. So although the ties and the mealers do still remain undated in radiometric terms, this is likely to be an extensive medieval industrial landscape in origin, which requires further analysis, further research, including radiometric dating, if you can do it, and environmental analysis. So let's talk about this peatland restoration scheme, bearing in mind the, all this archaeology. And in this slide, I'm showing you back to that image of the whole of the mapping in the guardianship boundary and the pink blob and the mauvey purple violet blob in the top right hand corner of the slide um, are two proposed or one, one active and one proposed peatland restoration scheme area. As we've heard from, uh, from Wendy, Peatland protection and restoration is listed in the UK government's 25-year environment plan, and the Dartmoor National Park Authority partnership plan includes peatland restoration targets for Dartmoor. That big coloured in area up in the, the top right-hand corner of that side is known as Great Nats Head. And Great Nats Head is a high open area of peat moor up in that top end of the guardianship site, and it's been identified for improvement. So the aim is to be able to mitigate erosion of degraded and drying blanket bog through improved water retention. So in the short term, the idea is to slow down the flow of water off the moor. Remember that slide where we had those lines of water running, thanks Chris, those lines of water running down the moor? The idea is to stop that, to limit carbon emissions from eroding peat, and in the longer term, water regulation will be improved and carbon sequestration can restart. And in the very long term, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, peat will start to reform. So I'm showing you a as, a, as yet uncatalogued, uh, oblique photograph recently taken by Damien as part of our, um, our ongoing uh, monitoring um, of some of this restoration work happening up, up there. And what we're looking at in this slide is a specially adapted backhoe, the white vehicle in the middle of the photograph has got special tracks. It's being used to make long timber buns as part of the peat restoration works. And various different sorts of installations are going to be put in to make sure that water can be held back on the moor rather than running away. Um, and their location has to be really carefully determined. So these log buns are being put in in the top end of those big peat cuttings, those big ties, Hopefully you can see the edges of them and the slight difference in vegetation colour. The idea is to hold the water back, to stop more runoff down through the ties, down the slope, taking, uh, taking the last remaining peat away and, and more erosion. And in the shallow water that's held back, um, the right kind of flora can re-establish for, for blanket bog roads. Exclusions for this work are put in place for the existing scheduled monuments. What this project in the survey has been able to do in demonstrating that amazing industrial, like your medieval and post-medieval industrial landscape, what that's been able to do is also put exclusions in place for the areas of all of those mealers, those, those little mounds right on the top on the high ground, um, to, uh, to maintain their setting in the landscape and also to, well, to preserve the, the actual features themselves, the actual features, features themselves. So to finish, it's English, Heritage's English Heritage Trust's responsibility on behalf of the UK Secretary of State to ensure that the archaeological monuments that are in these guardianship sites are passed on to future generations. 
So aerial survey is helping the trust to monitor and manage the estate, plan for the future. The impacts of vegetation change and erosion can be addressed with legible orthophotography and because of the greater confidence that can now be placed on the mapped positions of recorded features. We actually know where a lot of this archaeology really is on the ground for the first time. And we're making new discoveries, largely through access to things like the Environment Agency, uh, LIDAR data sets, and of course the new photography that we're creating ourselves. And these are contributing to future research and have the potential to contribute to future research. And ultimately, that means that a variety of stories can be told about people's past relationships with Dartmoor, and we can present a rich historical narrative to the visiting public. Thank you. We got it. Thank you, Katie, and for the uh, exercise session, which has kept, uh, kept us all on our toes. Um, a very strong paper, which has demonstrated to me the use of...